This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors. From simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII. And of course, politics. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, their handmade history-themed jewelry. Now, The Falcon Nest specializes in these gorgeous replicas of Anne Boleyn's famous bee necklace. Some of them are made with real pearls. They are amazing. You can find out more about them at the-falcon-nest.com. And be sure to use promo code TUTORSDYNASTY to receive 15% off. In recent years, this woman has become the fascination of many people, from being the smelly, unattractive fourth wife of Henry VIII to being one of the most fascinating of all his consorts. Anne of Cleves may have been the most fortunate of all six Tudor women because she survived. She outlived them all. While her treatment after Henry's death is reported to have been less warm during the rule of Somerset, I believe she had a happy life. But I'll be the first to admit that I don't know everything about the topic. On today's show, my guest Heather Darcy knows more. Heather became interested in the Renaissance period when she read a biography about Elizabeth I of England. She saw Elizabeth's world as both foreign yet familiar. For the last 10 years, Heather has studied the topic for this episode, and her new book about Anne of Cleves, called Anna, Duchess of Cleves, will be released in April in the UK and July in the US. Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to have you, but before I go into too much, I want to jump right into the controversy of your book cover. Recently, you released the image of your book cover on social media, and there were those who were a little bit upset with the title. Can you first start off and to explain to everyone who's listening what the title of your book is? It's called Anna, Duchess of Cleves, the King's Beloved Sister. Okay, Duchess, huh? So that's where the dispute is and using that word duchess. um, That's what I saw posted most on social media was she wasn't a duchess. So seeing as you've researched her for a decade, um, I have to assume that you obviously have evidence to back up the use of that. Yes. So the system in the Holy Roman Empire and the system in England are a bit different. So in England, for example, you have multiple types of perhaps being a queen. So you can be a queen consort like Anne Boleyn. You can be a queen regent, which is someone who kind of fills in for the king. And both Catherine of Aragon and Catherine Parr were queen's regent when Henry was off fighting France. You can be a queen regnant. So that would be like Elizabeth I or like Mary I. Um, In the instance of Anna, Women weren't allowed to inherit territory under Salic law, so there was no such thing as a duchess, um, a duchess regnant, if you will. So sh- you could be a duchess regent, meaning that you're basically a governor for someone who appointed you to be a governor or governess, I suppose is a better term. Or you could be a duchess consort, marrying that, meaning that you married a duke. Or you could be a born duchess. And why it's important to be a born duchess is that means that while you yourself cannot directly inherit the land. Whoever marries you is then Duke Jure Exoris, so through the right of marriage of the property. And a good example of that is actually Anna's own mother, Maria of Ulichberg. She was a born duchess of Ulichberg. She had no other siblings, so when she married Anna's father, she became recognized as the regent of Ulichberg, but Anna's father was the Duke of Ulichberg. Jure Uxoris, if I'm saying that word correctly. So Anna signed her legal documents from what I've seen, including her her marital documents for Henry VIII as Anna, born Duchess of Ulrich Cleesenberg. So really, she has quite the history of her own that I would say many of us probably don't know about. It's possible, and I'm I'm hoping to look at her from a German perspective and bring more of her German history to the fore for people to keep in mind when they're considering her life and her importance as an individual in not just English history, but also German history and the importance of her family in English and German history. 
That's wonderful. I think uh, that's it's great work that you're doing. Um, anytime you. somebody can take the time to, to focus on one particular person, I think it makes all the difference. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about your cover, too. And, yes. um, you know, we mentioned the name, but... Um, I, I look at the, at the cover of your book, and it's such an elegant cover, in my opinion. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's this beautiful red background. It almost looks like it's some type of tapestry. And in the middle, there is a, it looks like it's hanging on the wall, a portrait of Anne of Cleves in a gold frame. And the cover's got gold and white accents to it. And it's, it's just beautiful. I'm curious, Heather, what made you decide on that portrait on the cover? I think it's a beautiful portrait. And I think that we so often see the Hans Holbein, the younger portrait that's hanging in the Louvre or the miniature that he executed of her or the later work from the workshop of Basel Boyne that was done in the 1560s or 1570s, so long after Anna had passed away. And I was very excited to find this portrait, which as far as I know, the last time that it was widely understood to exist or be in public was in the 1940s, so before World War II. Actually, I, I should say the 1930s to early 1940s, so before World War II really took hold. When I look at that portrait, I'm drawn to it in in the, in the sense that it's a little bit more mysterious than when we look at the Holbein one, because I feel like the Holbein one has always been um, painted to make her look like something maybe that she wasn't. And this portrait, I look at it and I wonder, is that really what she looked like? I don't see a reason to believe that it isn't what she looked like. I did also find a companion portrait of some of her, of one of her family members that I believe was executed at around the same time. Um, there's more information about who possibly could have painted that portrait and the companion portrait and when they would have been painted. Wow. Oh, they're just beautiful. I love portraits. Yeah. They're made. They're just such a glimpse into history. Yeah, and I think what's neat, too, is if, if a person takes the portrait of Anna, this profile portrait that you're seeing, or three-quarters profile portrait that you're seeing on the cover, and also the Louvre portrait, there are distinct facial similarities there, but it's just such a different angle from the front of her face versus the side of her face. Right. We all look different that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's let's talk a little bit more. Obviously, we always talk about um, her being the German bride. Now, would you say that that's a fair statement by modern day maps um, that she was German? Yes, I think so. So her, a lot of her territory or her family's territory, I should say, is located along the Rhine River and they are in the central western portion of Germany in, uh, Germany in uh, North Rhine, Westphalia, Nordrhein-Westfalen. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so centered around and to the northwest for the most part of Dusseldorf or Dusseldorf. Um, without the, the accent. So, but they're very much on the, the German side. There are some portions of their territory that would be in modern day Netherlands, but most of it is concentrated in modern day Germany. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but if you've been listening, you can obviously tell that Heather um, can speak a little bit of German. <laughs> she does at a least really... a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. See, now all I can say is things like "sehr gut," yeah. <laughs> I have no accents. You are your accent is amazing. I Thank I you. absolutely love that. So, you have a bachelor's degree in German. I do. Yes. I started studying German when I was 15 as an act of rebellion against my parents. Um, I was in high school and I was taking orchestra and choir and my parents were convinced that I needed to take a language to graduate from high school, which was not true, but they would not believe me. And so my parents wanted me to drop choir and take Spanish and to be rebellious. I dropped orchestra and took German. So I started learning German when I was 15 and I have a bachelor's degree in German languages and literature. And then I've been able to keep up with it pretty well, I'd say over the past, um, geez, 10 years now. You know, um, when you found out I knew a little bit of German, of course, I just threw out a few words that I knew. And then you came back with like a whole paragraph of a conversation. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's on to me now. I don't I don't know as much as I pretend to know. <laughs> I, I become very excited when I think other people speak German. Um, I have a funny I have a funny anecdote, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. So yesterday I was at work and I think this is a pretty well-known secret, but I'm, I'm actually a lawyer, so I do have my Juris Doctorate as well. And I was at work yesterday, and I work with the public frequently, and I was in court, and uh, the judge 
who um, the judge I was in front of knew that I spoke German, and he was trying to be cute yesterday and ask me and ask me if one of my clients needed a Spanish interpreter. That is not how it came across. So I walk up, I introduce myself, say who I'm representing, and my judge says, with his American Midwestern flat tone, Sprechen Sie Deutsch. And for those of you who do not speak German, that literally means, do you speak German? So I responded to him in German because I knew he knew that I spoke German. I said, well, yes, Your Honor, I do speak German. And he said, no, no, no. I mean, does anyone else here speak German? And then I responded in German, no, I believe it's just me that speaks German. And so then after that, he clarified. And I said, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I thought you were joking with me, but I just misunderstood your joke. (laughs) So that was pretty good. And then uh, one of the other attorneys in the room later said to me that was pretty great that you spoke German to the judge I said well he knows I speak it he shouldn't ask me questions to which he doesn't want answers like <laughs> it was just kind of goofy but that was one moment yesterday that's cute yeah but, but my husband always jokes with me that the German language is such an ugly sounding language you know if you compare it to of course like French they're two different um sounding languages but to me there's still it has its own beauty um just the way sometimes sentences flow and such and you know uh i i had mentioned my dad is a second generation german american if you want to yes. call it that and so he grew up speaking german he had to be taught English in school. Oh, okay. And so my whole childhood, he had like nine siblings. And so my whole childhood was around aunts and uncles who were constantly speaking German. And so that's what inspired me to, in high school, take four years of German because I wanted to understand what they were saying. They were always laughing sure. and having a good time. I wanted, <laughs> to know, I wanted to know what they were saying. And after four years, I discovered the German that they speak is totally different than what they were teaching in school. And it was, and it wasn't just like the high German or low German. It was the part of the country where we live. It was like a specific one to them. And so there's, I would call my dad to wish him happy birthday and he didn't know what I was saying. Oh, okay. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So you're like, well, that was ruined. That was a waste of time. Wasn't it? You know, all's well that ends well, I suppose. <laughs> right. I was, at least, at least I tried. It, it was a good experience. It's yeah. a fun language, fun language to learn. Now, you recently um, did a little traveling for your research, and you spent some time in Germany um, and some other places, right? Yes, I did, and I I've traveled to a bunch of different places: England, of course, France, some other locations. And I went to Germany most recently this past fall. I went to England and France a couple times over the last few years to try and sort things out with Anna. But uh, yeah, I was in Germany in September and it worked out really well. I have these pen pals. My pen pal, her name's Tanya. She and I have been friends for, I don't know, I want to say maybe since as early as 2012, but I really think it was more like 2013. And so that was when I was starting to look into Anna and I guess doing the more passive types of research is just more reading books about the six wives of Henry the Eighth, and not necessarily focusing right on Anna. But my pen pal Tanya and her family all live in the suburbs around Dusseldorf. And it also happens to be where the main archives are that are relevant to Anna and her her family. And so I went over there and I stayed with Tanya and her family for, I think it was about 10 days. And we were able to go around and look at the different sites that were relevant to Anna and visit some places and just gain a better understanding of what I was looking at. I was able to take some photos, which are in the book of a castle that I do not believe was impacted or at least not meaningfully impacted by either one of the world wars, which is really significant because that area that Anna grew up in was definitely affected by particularly World War II. Um, For example, Cleves was bombed and the castle that her family owned was utterly destroyed. I believe the castle in Dunn where Hans Holbein took her portrait was also, if not destroyed, then severely damaged. So it was really great to be able to go to Germany and see some artwork relevant to her and visit some places which she would have recognized and also to visit a castle that was not meaningfully touched, like I said, by either one of the world wars and just understand what she would have seen or have a good example of what a building would have looked like that she 
would have lived in, if that makes sense. Oh, that's amazing. So did you have one of those moments the first time you were in a setting or a building where you knew she had been there? Did you have a moment where you stopped and touched the wall or... So I, I tend to be a pretty stoic, sober-minded person when it comes to these sort of things, but I will say that that one particular castle that is in very good condition, it has these window seats in the Great Hall, and I went and sat in one of those and just thought to myself about how Anna or her one of her family members could have sat in that same seat, and that was that was nice. That was a nice feeling in my friends that were with me took a picture of me so I could remember sitting in the seat. Um, and then oh. when I went to England, I'm sorry, when I went to England back in 2016, I went into Westminster Abbey and I knew that she was buried there, but she wasn't on the tour, but I knew where her tomb was. And so I went and I stood up by her tomb because you can't get close to it. It's on the, I believe the South side of the main altar. So you can just kind of see it, but you can't, mm. you can't touch it or anything. Not that you should go about touching tombs anyway, but um, <laughs> so that was a strong moment for me too, just to be that close and that far away from her and just wondering, just thinking about her funeral. I know that that might sound morbid, but thinking about her funeral and just admiring her tomb and trying to really commit what it looked like to memory. I'm just so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems, you know, and just to be able to, to go over there and be able to get a, a peek at it in person. Yeah. Um, must be just quite profound. So I went to Hampton Court Palace on that same trip, and it's beautiful. And anyone that's interested in in Tudor architecture, really, I think I think there are some Georgian parts. Don't quote me on this because my history knowledge kind of dies after about 1625 in England. Um, it, it's a beautiful building, and everyone should go visit it if you have a chance. It's phenomenal. But I was really hoping to see something having to do with Anna there because she did spend some time there. I believe when she was a queen consort and then also when she would go and, and visit henry and things throughout the rest of his life but i'd spent all day traipsing around hampton court palace and i did not see anything there that i noticed so i'm not saying there isn't anything there i don't know for sure but i just didn't really see anything but then i'm in the buttery of hampton court palace enjoying my scone with my uh what is it called? Clotted cream, which is something I love, but we don't have in the United States. And I discovered on that trip and there is this lead platter in the buttery and I hope it's still there, but it used to belong to Arthur Tudor. So Henry the eighth's older brother. And at some point Anna received this platter and it has her lozenge on it. And so I was very <laughs> excited to see that in the buttery of all places. So just so we can get the full effect here, because obviously this is something that was pretty exciting. Can you explain to everybody what that is? Yes. So when we think of coats of arms, we think of that classic shield shape and that is a masculine shape, but um, there's a term, I believe it's a heraldic heiress uses a diamond shape and that's called a lozenge. So whenever you see that diamond shape, it means that it's a woman's coat of arms. Oh, yeah. Well, that's interesting. So I've always been fascinated by the coat of arms, but I, you know, don't necessarily always understand what message they hold because I know they hold a lot of messages. Can you tell us um, about a bit about um, Anna's coat of arms? Sure. I'll start with the lozenge. So what she frequently used for her symbol was the S carbuncle of Cleves, which is that gold gear on a red background that we see so frequently for her. Uh, and that actually comes from a shield design. So if you think of an old shield, they would have these iron braces on the outside of wooden shields. And that's what that symbol comes from. So the eight arms of a of a shield. Um, and then she used the lion of Ulich, which was just a black lion. And um, that would be on the maternal side of the lozenge. So, so Anna's full coat of arms features the black lion of Ulich on a yellow background in the top left. And then it has the yellow crowned lion of Gelders on a blue background. And then next to that, we see the mark of Cleves, which is a golden S carbuncle. So that kind of gear or shield shape with an escutcheon that's white behind it on a red background. And then all the way over on the right, on the top side, we see a white background and there is a red lion crowned with a blue crown. And that is for Berg. And you will see that lion frequently in uh, Dusseldorf. That lion is all over Dusseldorf because that used to be the uh, capital for 
Ulichenberg, and of course, Berg. And then on the bottom left, we see the, it kind of looks like a checkerboard pattern. So it's a yellow background, and there's a band that goes across the middle with a red and white checker pattern, and that represents mock. And then in the middle, there is the red lion with a gold crown. So it's different from the lion from, for uh, Berg. So this one's red with a gold crown on a white background, and that represents Zutphen. And then on the bottom right, we see kind of like a, a white and red chevron pattern, and that represents Raffensberg. And those were all the territories that made up the United Duchies that Anna's father and brother and nephew ruled. You could almost say like a coat of arms was like your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> or um, I think it was more, so it was kind of like that, or maybe even more like the golden arches of McDonald's. So if you see the golden <laughs> arches somewhere, no, bear with me here. If you see the golden arches somewhere, you straight up know that that's McDonald's. If you're familiar with the symbol, or I think of like the, the Mercedes Benz, it's that three, the propeller prop in the circle. So you know it's a Mercedes. So if you saw those arms slapped on a building, you knew that that belonged to Anna's family. Or I was talking about um, the line of Berg, the, the red line with the blue crown on the white background. If you're running around the Duchy of Berg and you see that red line there, you know that you're in Berg. Um, because keep in mind, people couldn't read. Or, or it's not that they couldn't. It's just literacy rates weren't as high back then. So it made more sense to use images to say, hey, this is ours versus um, words. You know, uh, mentioned LinkedIn because it made me think of beer, you know, yes. network, net, networking, yes. you, you tend to drink beer. And you had mentioned something in pre-show um, about Anna liking English beer. Yes. So I think that is a misconception. And let me tell you why. So I have been researching beer production. It's it's very interesting to me. And it uh, I wrote a paper about beer production in the 16th century for my master's program, actually working on a master of arts degree in early modern history and focusing on the Holy Roman Empire, uh, particularly the first half of the 16th century under Charles V. And that's when Anna was alive. And uh, what I figured out was that one of the people in Anna's household, and I can't remember the person's title off the top of my name, he actually sought an export license for a tremendous amount of beer. It was something like over 200,000 gallons of beer. And why he did that, I think, is because um, people used to be tax farmers. And so what that meant is someone would have an export license or perhaps an import license, and then they would gather the tax monies collected for exporting the beer, keep a portion of it, and then refer the rest of it to the royal treasury. So that was a way to earn income if you were given one of these export or import licenses. So, and I'm sure, I, I'm guessing she probably liked it, but I think that the, the biggest thing for her would have been the income to her estate from exporting, from having that beer export right. license. Right. Heather, I want you, you know, we've talked We've talked a little bit today um, about your research um, with her and what got you started, you know, so to speak. But I would want to know what Anna means to you. I can tell you what I admire about her. So I think that she was a very clever person. I think that she wound up in a bad situation. I think she did an excellent job maintaining her dignity. There are some moments where she was very, very human and very upset about what happened. But overall, she... She did well for herself. I think that she was able to cultivate a relationship with Mary and Elizabeth, which you can read about in my book, and I believe it's been touched on by other historians and authors as well. I think that I think that she she had a great way of throwing shade, which we'll leave it at that, and you can read about it in the book, but she she was very good at throwing shade in subtle manners, <laughs> which I enjoy. Um, and I guess overall with this adventure that I've gone on with Anna, I just hope that if there's some bit of her that still exists, that she's happy that I did this and that she doesn't feel that I've disrespected her in any way. Because I think that when we're thinking about or writing about or discussing historical figures, we have to remember that they are people and that they did exist at one point and that they had feelings at one point. And I think that it's vital that we don't force our 21st century 
ideals or our hopes or dreams or fantasies about these these deceased individuals onto them. And of course, everyone does that. I'm sure I did that in my book to an extent too, because we are only human. But I think that it's important that we re respect and honor the dead and that we do genuinely try to bring forward more information about who they were and what their lives were like without using rose tinted glasses. Heather, thank you so much for being a guest <laughs> on today's show. I love that you're able to share a little bit um, of Anne of Cleves with us. Can you tell everyone again the name of your book and when and where it will be available for purchase? Yes, it is called Anna. So Anna, Anna, Duchess of Cleves, the King's Beloved Sister. It's available for purchase right now on Amazon.co.uk um, and Amazon.com and Amazon.de for the German speakers out there. Uh, the book is only available in English. It is all for pre-order. I misspoke a moment ago. It is released in the United Kingdom on on April 15th and then in Germany and the United States on July 1st. However, right now, if you want to pre-order it on amazon.co.uk and you live in the United States, even if you have to pay shipping because American Prime doesn't translate over to UK Prime, I think it's a slightly less expensive than the pre-order for the US release. If you can't remember the title, just type in my last name, D-A-R-S-I-E, and it'll pop up. Perfect. Um, Heather, you also have a blog and a Facebook page. Yes. So my website is maidensandmanuscripts.com. And I recently launched a German speaking tab. So I'm hoping to add a couple more articles to that. I just put out a, a welcome. So it, it is, I'm hoping to develop it into a bilingual website for German speakers and English speakers. And then if you just look up Heather R. Darcy historian, again, it's D-A-R-S-I-E. You can find me on Facebook and I am on Twitter, though I don't, I don't avail myself of Twitter very often. And it's at H.R. Darcy history. Awesome. Heather, thank you again so much for being on the show with us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast was brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, handmade history-themed jewelry. The Falcon Nest specializes in gorgeous replicas of that famous Anne Boleyn bee necklace. See more at the-falcon-nest.com. And be sure to remember to use promo code Tudor's Dynasty to receive 15% off. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Wait a second. You don't think I'd actually forget to thank my patrons, did you? It's because of these wonderful people that this show exists. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click on Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. So I have one new patron since the last episode. It was Sally Ann F., so I'd like to give a big shout out to Sally Ann. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Adrian S., Angela G., Anna K., Ann L., Azaria J., Bob W., Carrie H., Cheryl T., Courtney D., Cynthia Y., Diana O., Diane B., Donna K., Doris C., Heather Tesco of the English Renaissance History Podcast, Heidi H., James V, Jen, Jennifer V, Joy B, Catherine R, Kathy K, Katie F, Lacey W, Lyra L, Lisa N, Mary J, Mary T, Megan B, Melissa S, Michelle T, Nicole T, Nora C, Rachel C, Rebecca H, Sarah C, Sari G, Shelby H, Sue K, Stacy C, and Tanya R. Thank you again for joining me. Until next time.